This is the Ben Shear Golf Podcast, where we will be talking science, fitness, and everything golf performance. All right, welcome to part two of the Ben Shear Golf Podcast on speed and power for golf. So what did John Daly, Phil Mickelson, Jason Day, Rory Sabatini, Gary Woodland, and Bubba Watson all have in common? Well, they all hit bombs, and I know you want to also. Okay, so in part one, when we talked about speed and power, I went over some really basic stuff. I went over how, what the definition of power is, force times distance over time, and I talked about basic starting points for people who want to get involved with an exercise program as related to increasing club head speed. So I gave some general buckets of what we should do with juniors, with women, for the average golfer, you name it, and some places and things that they can do to get started right away on an exercise program to help them increase their speed. Today, we're gonna to take a little bit of a deeper dive, a little bit more of a scientific look, and a little bit more of a sophisticated understanding on how we kind of get into uh, a more complete prescription for a, creating a program for you. Like this is gonna be like, how do I figure out exactly what I should do for me, not generalities, not being put in a bucket. How do I figure out with me? And obviously in today's technical world of awesome technology and all this great stuff that we have going on, our ability to test, measure, and then take that information and create customized programming as a prescription are better than they've ever been before. So it's a pretty interesting time and a pretty cool time to be involved uh, in this type of training. And if you're looking to create club head speed and you want to get involved in the program, you know, you can go out and go through really detailed, really oriented uh, evaluations. And then if you're working with the right people who know what they're doing, they can create an awesome prescription for you for increasing club head speed. So in part one, we define force. We could define it, sorry, power as force or strength times distance or flexibility or mobility by time. So force times distance divided by time was our equation. Okay, so if you didn't check out part one and you're kind of just getting into this, I definitely recommend you going back and listening to episode one on our speed and power for golf and you can get a good understanding of the basic concepts because today we're going to get a little bit uh, further in the weeds and if, you, if you're struggling with the concepts, I think it's going to be a little bit harder to follow along. But if, you, if you're knowledgeable about this topic and or you're in the strength and conditioning world or therapy world or just have a passion for this type of stuff certainly uh, this is a good place to start so most people who are into working out they're doing strength and conditioning they're doing power work they're doing whatever you know they tend to find a combination of plyometric exercises weightlifting med balls whatever the case may be and they know that oh lifting weights makes me strong plyos and med ball make me fast or create speed and they kind of have a program that they work on hoping for the best. Well, that's good. And certainly you can reap benefits from this approach, no doubt. But in today's world, we can actually dial in how much of your should be strength work, how much should be speed work, how much load, how much speed, how fast, how heavy, how anything you want. Really, really targeted and specific to you, right? So typically we have evaluations that we do in our world but oftentimes we're looking at basic strength, basic power. We're looking at you know flexibility, whatever the case may be. And when we look at flexibility as an example, it's easy to say, okay, well, we lack trunk rotation, so we're gonna work on thoracic mobility, and we have a bunch of exercises that we can do to work on that, or hip mobility, or whatever it is that we're working on. It's a lot harder to dial in. I can look at your power, but power is a general term, right? So we have this force times distance over time. Well, how do I know if I'm limited in force how do I know if I'm uh, limited in velocity? Like, how do I know where my particular problem lies in this equation, right? So we can get into that. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that today, kind of what we call force velocity profiling. And then we're gonna also talk about a concept that I call resistors and releasers. And that's another level which will build on top of our force velocity relationship and has a direct impact on what type of swing style you should be using to maximize your club head speed uh, while on the course. So th this is an important concept uh, that we have to kind of start digging into. This is the future, right? Technology is changing everything we do from our cell phones to our computers. Everything we do in life is monitoring us, tracking us, doing all that stuff. 
Uh, the golf world obviously has been very progressive in this technology world with things like TrackMan, launch monitors, force plates, you name it. We have all kinds of awesome 3D technology in the golf world. The fitness world, strength and conditioning world, uh, is kind of right there as well. And just really starting to explode now in the use of modern technology to help us better help our clients achieve their goals. So what do I do with this information? So, uh, Every person has an optimal force velocity relationship, right? So there's a relationship between, let's just say how strong I am, force, and how fast I am, velocity, right? So I have this force and velocity relationship, right? So some people are super strong and they're slow. Other people are super fast, but they're weak. You can be somewhere in the middle. A lot of times it's really hard to tell because what actually is strong, what actually is fast. Do you even know if you're measuring speed, what fast should be for different movements? So it can be a little bit uh, of a complicated thing. And like I said, the beauty of today's modern technology is that we can actually measure these things, evaluate these things, and then uh, use them. And there's been some recent actual research going into this type of stuff. So in a recent study published in the Frontiers in Physiology Journal by, and I'm gonna look down to read these names, uh, Pedro Jimenez Reyes, Pierre Samozino, Matt Bugali, and John Benoit Morin, and I'm sure I just butchered their names, so I apologize uh, for them. But what they did is they looked at using force velocity profiling uh, and its use in exercise selection as related to jump height. So they had 60 people in their study. Their average age was 24 years old, and they were basically all came from like professional, semi-professional soccer, futsal, and rugby. So you obviously had a pretty good population of athletes uh, in this test. And what they did, they were assigned to one of four groups. They basically did some jump squat testing and they on a Smith machine, and they loaded the bar ranging from 15 to 90 kilograms. And at the end, they classified you in one of four buckets. So we basically had a high force deficit group, so meaning, let's call them the really weak people. Then we had a low force deficit people, which are, they're, weak. they're not like the really weak people, but in what we would consider optimal, they're not quite strong enough, right? Then we had the low velocity deficit, right? So those people, they're not, they're a little bit slow, but not super slow, but on our optimal measurement, they're on the slower end of things. And then we have our high velocity deficit. We're gonna call those the slow people for the sake uh, of this argument. And what they did is they took those people and they put them in those four different groups, right? And so the people who were in the high force deficit or the weak people, they were doing very heavy based, strength based work, right? The people who were the low force deficit, who were the slightly weak people, but not that bad, they were doing what we call strength power work. So it was still focusing on strength, but there was a little bit of a speed component. It wasn't quite as heavy, and there was a little bit of a speed component in their program as well. The low velocity deficit people, they would do what we call power speed work, which is means it's all pretty quick, but some of it still got some load to it, right? It's not just focusing on pure speed. There still is some load, but it's light enough that you can move it, let's say, relatively quickly. And then the high velocity deficit people, they were just basically doing super high velocity, maximal speed type work. As you went through the process, what they did is, if you move from one group to the next, so let me say I was a high force deficit person, right? And I started getting a bit stronger. I didn't stay in that same group in my training. The minute I crossed the barrier, and they have specific numbers that they use for barriers, but once I went from high, velo high force deficit to low force deficit, I'm still a force deficit person, but I'm not as much. I actually changed my protocol for my training to match that new group that I now belong in. And they basically, every two weeks, are testing the subjects to see had they moved from one bucket, let's just say, uh, to the next for a simplistic way of thinking about it, right? So what did they find? So they did this study and what they find is that the high force deficit and the low force deficit, they all, they, uh, they had an increase in their theoretical force, right? They all had extreme increases in their force. Pretty good, pretty important, but obviously we're, what our ultimate goal is to measure the jump height, right? So at the end of the day, we're trying to increase jump height. We're not saying the weak guy got stronger, but he didn't jump higher as an example. The goal is, did I, get, did I use that model to ultimately increase the power output of the jump. And I'm, you know, you might be saying, well, this is a jump, it's not a rotary movement, it's not golf, it's not whatever, guess what? 
it doesn't matter. We're really just measuring their physiology, right? Their physiology tells me you're strong, you're fast, it's partly your neurologic system, it's your muscular system, it's the physiology of the person that matters, not specifically the movement that we're testing. You can pretty much do any movement that you have the ability to evaluate, come up with an answer, and reasonably assume that that physiological marker is gonna be represented across the board, right? So that high force and low force steps of group, they had large increases in max full force. They had a significant reduction in their force velocity imbalance, right? And they, show, they showed large increases in jump height. So they did everything. They got stronger. Their relationship to force and velocity got better. And they significantly jumped, improved jump height. Then the other side, we had that high velocity deficit and the low velocity deficit group, right? And within that, Again, they had large velocity increases. They again, extremely reduced their uh, imbalance between their force velocity curve. And as well, they had increases in jump height. So if anybody actually wants this uh, link to this type of, uh, this actual research study, we'd be happy to provide it for you. You can always hit us up on social media or whatever the case may be, and we'll be happy to provide you with the links uh, to this. So you can then go about taking a look at for yourself and kind of reading all the specific details. Obviously, I'm just quickly summarizing their findings here and, and what they did. If you're interested, you can kind of go uh, down that path, you can do it. All right, so like I said, so these are looking at jumps and we're looking at physiology. Uh, in today's world, if you really wanted to get into looking at testing this type of stuff with rotation as an example, there are some really cool technologies out there like 1080 motion, cable machines and stuff like that. We actually have them in my facility, but you know, these are not gonna be things that are gonna be super readily available uh, because of the cost. They're just prohibitively expensive for people to use, to do, and you're not gonna be able to kind of get access unless you come to a facility like this. I mean, there are certainly others in the country, but not a large uh, amount of them. I mean, there are some other cool things out there now like ballistic balls and weighted medicine balls that have sensors, et cetera, in them. But that being said, uh, I don't think you're gonna ever be able to get them to be heavy enough to assess the force end of the curve. They're good for testing the velocity end of the curve, but because you can't load them up heavy enough, you're not gonna have a you know, 100 pound medicine ball or whatever the case may be, you're not gonna really be able to assess the force end of that curve. So you're gonna need some type of assessment that makes a little bit more sense in a way that you can do this type of testing. So this is an important part of the evaluation because like we said, once you figure out which one of those buckets you fall in, I'm a high force guy, a low velocity guy, whatever the case may be, as you see, that has big implications to what we should be doing in our training, right? So I listed off, if you're a low force person, you're gonna be lifting heavy weights. If you're a low velocity person on the opposite end of the spectrum, you're gonna be doing a lot of high speed, low load work, really trying to maximize how quickly you can move. And then the two in the middle have some relationship to what we do. And then you're asking, okay, how do I go about doing this type of testing? I don't have all of this fancy equipment, blah, 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 blah. So you don't, don't need to have all of the most expensive stuff in the world. There's a lot of ways that we could go about doing this testing. Um, there's a lot of cool technologies out there. Obviously pluses and minuses of all of them. Uh, things like force plates. You can do a lot of this testing on force plates, right? Force plates can though be very expensive. Force plates can give also give you a lot more information about all of this stuff as well, right? It's gonna give you a really detailed picture. So it's a great, great way to do it. Um, there's things called GymAware, which is basically a cable, simplistically to think about as a cable attached to a bar and it's got a cable and it's measuring how fast the bar is moving. I can put that on my back or whatever and jump up and down and it can measure the displacement of that bar, the velocity it's moving. And then I could put obviously different loads on that bar and I know at this load it moved this fast, whatever the case may be. Um, that's a pretty, still a pretty expensive but not crazy expensive piece of equipment. Uh, and then there's some cheaper options if you wanna measure bar velocity or even body velocity, things like push bands uh, which a lot of people are using these days, which is basically a small little uh, accelerometer that you can either put around your waist while you're doing jumping if you're holding a bar. You can actually get an attachment that it hooks to the bar itself and measure the bar uh, is a great way to do it. And then you have a thing called Bar Sensei, which is actually a sensor that just attaches to your bar dimension, also a pretty inexpensive way to do it. And then the cheapest, easiest way to do it 
um, is there's a thing called the Just Jump To app. It's an app you can buy on your phone. Your phone has its own accelerometers built right into it, which is really cool. Um, so you're gonna then put your load on, however you're gonna go about loading the system. You're gonna do your different movements. You're gonna get your velocity of movement on your phone. And they even have calculations in there to give you a force velocity profile doing that. So that's a pretty simple, easy way for you to do it. So if you're looking to dial your program in a little bit more specifically and understand where you are in this, so you know specifically what you should be doing in the gym, certainly force velocity profile. Again, force to think about a strength, velocity to think about a speed. That's something you want to start digging into. So I'm going to take a quick break, but when I come back, we're going to dig into resistors and releasers. And that's just going to take this one step further. We're going to go one step further with understanding with, I'm going to use jump testing again as an example of how I can look at how my body functions. Now we're going to start looking at elasticity of the body and how we use what's called stretch shorten and A, how that affects our training and B, how that affects our golf swing. Do you want to take your body and game to the next level? Do you want to get a program from the best in the business the same way tour players do but don't have access to the finances to do it? Finally, Ben Shear Golf is offering various online training options for players just like you. Now you too can have access to the best golf fitness has to offer online and at a price you can afford. For more information, go to our website, www.bensheargolf.com to learn more. That is www.bensheargolf.com, S-H-E-A-R to spell Shear. I'm Ben Shear, PGA Tour trainer, Golf Digest Fitness Advisor and host of the Golfer's Edge on Sirius XM PGA Tour Radio. So when I first saw these sticks, I knew I had to get involved. Three huge benefits from this type of program. Number one, it's gonna allow us to get our club and our body in positions to have a consistent, efficient, and effective golf swing. Number two, it's gonna reduce our risk of injuries. And number three, the big thing everyone is looking for, it's gonna allow us to hit the ball that much further. As a listener to the Ben Shear Golf Podcast, you're eligible for a 10% discount on all stick and golf-related purchases from Stick Mobility. Just use the promo code BEN10, that is BEN with the number 10, all one word. Go to stickmobility.com to learn more. That is BEN, the number 10, all one word. Welcome back. Remember when I was mentioning Daly, Day, Mickelson, Woodland, Watson, and McElroy, all being bombers? They all are, but they all go about creating that distance and speed in different ways. So what do Jay Day, Rory McIlroy, and Gary Woodland have in common? What they all do is they all resist their back their pelvis on the backswing. They don't have a big hip turn. They have a big coil against a stable lower body, and then they fire their hips out below, what we call X-factor stretch, a term coined by Jim McLean and Phil Cheatham years ago about creating this stretch between the pelvis and the torso, and then this whipping action comes as the body closes that gap and whips it down. Those guys, like I said, they resist their backswing. They create tons of coil. And those guys tend to have, I'll call it shorter backswings. Maybe their driver on top of the backswing is parallel to the ground. You know, Gary's is even much shorter than that, right? They don't have long, long swings. So those guys in our force times distance times time situation, they don't have a lot of distance. So they have to create that speed really, really fast. And what they're doing is they're using elasticity, that, that rubber banding action of the muscular system to create their speed, or what we call stretch shorten, right? We've all heard muscles are like rubber bands, and when you stretch them, they're gonna snap back. Those guys are really, really effective at using that stretch shorten. And basically, stretch shorten just means that we, we stretch the tendon uh, of the muscle. When it gets stretched, it wants to recoil to its natural length, so we put it on stretch. We let, you know, we put tension as we let it go, it quickly and abruptly recoils back to its natural state, and all of a sudden you get this fast explosive contraction, right? So those guys, those type of athletes, the Woodlands, the Days, the McElroys, they are using this resisted type of backswing, I call. I call them resistors. So what do Phil, Bubba, and Daly have in common, right? All of those guys, they have their lead knee kind of move away from the target, kind of collapse in. The front heel tends to come up off the ground and they have really long swings and their club is way beyond parallel and across the line, right? 
those guys have released everything to get as much distance we've talked about and get the club head as much distance as it can to get back to the ball. So they have more distance to travel to create speed. So they don't need this super fast, elastic, contractile properties to actually get speed because you know what they've done? They've given themselves a lot of, t a lot of distance to get that club moving and get that speed up to those similar numbers that we see from Rory and Jay Day, et cetera, but they're doing it in a totally, totally different manner, right? So it's two different strategies, but I would say equally effective. All of those guys hit the ball really far. They're all great players. They all are able to get the job done consistently. All the things that you would look for in a great swing, but they're going about it two different ways, right? So the, I'll call the, the resistors are more kind of the modern swing and some of this other stuff is out kind of more of a traditional old school release swing, right? So it's easy to say, see the two differences when we give those examples of what these players do, right? But the question is, what are you, right? And earlier in this episode, I talked about trying to figure out where you are on the force velocity curve, right? I'm a high force guy, I'm a low velocity guy, whatever uh, I might be. And this is now gonna take that jump testing that we use to the next test. So now what do I need to know? I need to know, are you an elastic athlete? Do you benefit from that stretch shorten that Jay Day and Rory and these guys are using, or do you not benefit from it, right? So what we do is we use jump testing, again, just looking at physiology here, not golf swings, looking at physiology to understand where you fall. So we use two, in this example, we use two different types of jump tests. The first one we do is what we call a counter movement jump test. A counter movement jump is basically think about as a normal way we jump. If I asked you most people to jump, they would go down and they would go up. The down action as I quickly go down, that loads and stretches all the muscles on the back part of my body, my glutes and my calves and my Achilles and all of that stuff gets loaded and I get a big stretch, right? And then I try to use that to propel myself forward and jump up high. That's a counter movement squat jump, right? So I get a stretch and then hopefully a recoil and I jump up. The other type of jump we're gonna use is just a real squat jump. So a regular squat jump, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually go down to the bottom of my position. Like if I think about that dip down phase, I'm gonna just start there at that bottom. I'm gonna hold that position for at least four seconds. You can't go and go quickly because the, the reflex, the stretch reflex after about four to five seconds will turn off. There's a timing component to using stretch. So I go down, I get in that bottom position, and I just pause there for four or five seconds. And then I jump up, but I cannot counter down at that point at all, right? So I don't wanna have any counter movement. I wanna go from my bottom position straight up. So the, the squat jump goes boom, boom. And then the counter movement, I actually start down here and I only go up, right? So one has a counter movement, one does not. The counter movement is creating the stretch, the other one is not. So now I'm gonna look at, I mean, I do it on force plates because I can get a lot of information. I can see how much force you created. I can see how fast you created. I can use all that kind of stuff. But for typical people, like we said earlier, maybe you have a just jump app or a, uh, push bands or whatever, you can just use jump height as your measure here to do this testing, right? Here, we're not looking at load. We're doing all of this just body weight. We're just looking at the utilization of stretch, okay? So, and then what I wanna do is compare, well, how high did I jump in the counter movement or the one with stretch versus how high did I jump in the movement without stretch? I'm looking for about a 15%, whichever one is 15% better, okay? If they're about even, in my opinion, in my opinion, and I'm sure people have their own opinion, which is fine. If I was the same, I would choose to be a releaser because I think it puts less stress and strain on the body, okay? So if I had my choice, I would go down that path. But from a testing purpose, if you're 15% or more better in either one, you clearly should be in that bucket. So if I did better with the counter movement jump, with the stretch, I am a resistor. I should keep my pelvis more stable. I should coil more, feel like I fire that lower body sooner, get that X factor stretch, get that stretching in the muscles and that recoil, and boom, that's gonna be my optimal way for me to swing. If on the other side, 
I'm actually not benefiting from stretching. Why am I trying to resist my hips and all that stuff? Then I want to get as much distance as I can and much opportunity to create speed on my way down because that's going to be a lot easier. Because I'm not elastic, being short is going to be a very tough way for me to generate a lot of speed. Right? That's not going to be the optimal way for me uh, to go about it. Right. So we have this resistors and releasers and where do you fall in that bucket. So this is how I do the test, right? So now I've decided the test. I know what bucket I'm in. Wow, I just changed my swing. If you do nothing else, most people right away will get better just from doing this, right? Just right away. A couple things to really think about. So number one is there's some training implications to this, right? So if I had a young kid who came to me and, you know, he's a releaser and maybe his coach wants him to be a resistor, I may think about trying to use the gym as an opportunity to change that kid and shift them from releaser to actually learn how to build and become uh, a resistor, right? A big part of why certain people are not good resistors is what we call eccentric utilization, meaning they're not good at the braking forces. If you think about jumping, there's the force that I jump up with, but when I go down and change direction quick, there's that braking force at the bottom that allows me to change direction quickly. That's eccentric and isometric strength. If I'm not really strong and stable down there, I'm never gonna get that proper stretching and loading of that system. So a lot of people, they might be strong, but they're only strong in what we call the concentric or the up phase. They're not actually strong in the down or what we call eccentric phase. So oftentimes, teaching that young kid who maybe hasn't developed his eccentric strength yet, how to create some eccentric and isometric strength is the key to making him a ballistic, more resistor type of athlete. And then obviously I can do plyometric jumpings. So I wanna be overloading the down. So instead of maybe doing a box jump as an example, up on a box, I might start on a box, jump down and then up. And that down action is gonna overload that braking system first before I go up, right? So I go down up versus from the ground, just up, right? So the just up doesn't have that big eccentric loading. But when I hit the ground from the height of the box, man, I gotta put on a lot of brakes to stop myself from getting collapsed into the ground. So I can use that as a way to train eccentric utilization. There's some really cool equipment things that we have here at my facility, like um, K boxes and different flywheel and ISO inertial training and 1080s, like I mentioned earlier, that you can actually do eccentric overloading and stuff like that to do it. But I just gave you some simple examples of things you can do pretty much uh, anywhere. So if I had that young kid, then I'm gonna make a decision which direction I wanna go. If you're the average typical male and you sit behind the desk and you work all day and you have a regular job and you don't have, you're not a professional athlete and you show up as a releaser, just be a releaser, right? As we age, our contractile properties go away. Our neurosystem slows down. The elasticity of our tissues decreases, right? Our skin starts to sag. We lose elasticity through our whole body. It's why, unfortunately, professional athletes, when they get to a certain age and a certain point in their career, they're no longer professional athletes. Like, you know, if you took a major league baseball player, I'm a Yankee fan, so I'll talk about Derek Jeter, right? Like, did Derek Jeter lose his talent or did his neurosystem slow down this much? And did the elasticity of his body get this much less? And all of a sudden he can't play, right? That's what happens to him. And you're talking about a guy who has the best trainers in the world, never sat behind a desk, has access to anything. So his process happens slower. But for the rest of us, if we're sitting behind a desk, not doing the right stuff, right? That, ha that process actually happens much quicker and much sooner. Yes, I know there's outliers and some people who can defy all of this stuff, but in general, it's gonna be very hard for the 50 something year old, 40 something year old guy who's lost that elasticity and that stretch shortened ability to ever really gain it back to a point where it's gonna be super valuable to them. They would be much better off increasing their flexibility, releasing in their swing, getting a bigger turn, getting that extra distance, and boom, all of a sudden, they're gonna be starting hitting the ball further, just way quicker, way easier. Life is just simply much better uh, than it would by you know trying to change their physiology. How about just use your physiology to your advantage? So that person, if they're gonna do training in the gym, right? I might do, that person I might do box jumps with, right? But I might actually go to the bottom of my squat position before I jump up, hold for that four or five seconds, and then try to just jump up without going any, without going down at all and using my system in a way that allows me to actually just work on creating that speed as an independent effort, right? So there's important implications to all of this type of stuff. And again, you know, I talked about testing on a force plate. This is how I do it. 
Again, I do some of this type of testing on my 1080 system and rotary as well. Um, but you can do a lot of this, you know, look, you could test counter movement versus non-counter movement jumping by literally putting some chalk on your fingertip, jumping up and hitting a wall in both different directions and see how, what's the difference between the two jump heights, right? I mean, and you can measure, did you improve 15% or more or not, right? So you don't have to have high tech equipment to do this basic resistor and releaser testing like you do in the force velocity uh, profiling. This is something you can figure out pretty simple. But the real magic starts lying is when you start doing all this. I have a force velocity profile, right? I have my resistor and releaser testing. I have all of this stuff. And now I know what swing works, what exercises work, how much load, how fast, how everything I need to do. And I just dial that in, boom, now my results are exponentially better than they were before, right? So, you know, this is a new topic. I've been teaching it for the last few years, this resistor and releasers. The force velocity thing is a little bit new as well, probably for most trainers even, and not often being done. It's something we offer here. You can literally come to our facility and do force velocity profiling and resistor and releaser testing. If you want to do it, certainly you can give us a shout, but hopefully this gives you some cool ideas of ways you can approach this. You can take this information, immediately apply it to your workout program and or to your swing and allow you to really increase your club head speed. So, you know, this is the wrap of part two of our speed and power program, right? So whether you use what we talked about in part one and you just say, hey, look, I'm the typical X, Y, and Z and use some basic guidelines, I know you're gonna get great results, but if you're looking to totally maximize and optimize your training program, you certainly should be looking at the things we talk about here with force velocity profiling, as well as resistors and releasers. We'll catch you next. Thanks for listening. Please give us a follow on social and check out our website at www.bencheergolf.com for all of our programs and products. Also, be on the lookout for our next episode as we continue to discuss the best of everything golf before.